Thank you for inviting me to this wonderful meeting. I think this thing of throwing together both communities is uh, great, and the previous talks uh, are so, uh, were so awesome that I feel quite intimidated. Um, so I'm going to talk about model building in Shell XC, um, where uh, I have just incorporated uh, sidechain tracing. And uh, so in crystallography, when you start from uh, uh, phases from MR, from uh, experimental phasing, they are often not accurate enough uh, and uh, you can improve them as part of the phasing process. So uh, you uh, make the starting solution look more protein-like, and Eleanor was showing uh, some uh, cases, especially from uh, experimental phasing, which is good because I will be showing more things that start from models and that explain why we have uh, gone into this direction in, in Shell XC. So uh, there are uh, papers as old as in the 60s from, from Peter Main on density modification and uh, the uh, Hope and uh, Gassman contribution is created as being the first time when it was uh, successfully used for small molecules to, to enhance uh, um, partial solution, uh, to enhance a, a solution of a small molecule at high resolution data. But it's, of course, a field where there are lots of uh, contributions, like uh, uh, after uh, those from uh, uh, Gerard Ricoin in 76 or um, uh, VC1, which is solvent flattening in 85, and a lot in the uh, 90s with uh, Jean Peter Abraham's uh, solvent flipping. And I think the first uh, molecular replacement, the first uh, density modification program I used was uh, um, Frederick Villers and Randy Reed's uh, Angel and Demon in those days. And uh, of course, in more recent times, there's the statistical density modification from, from Tom Terwilliger and, and also from Kevin Cotton. So, uh, borrowing from the international tables, from, from that paper, what we have is uh, starting phases from uh, molecular replacement or experimental, wherever you have them, um, you can calculate a map and you can make it look like a better map. And that would be what your starting map looks like just from that helix. So, you see a very clear map around the helix and some features uh, in the rest of the map, which you can improve by density modification. So if we focus on that second helix in the structure, we see that here it will be difficult to recognize that we have an helix here, and here it's not a nice helix, but it's clear. Uh, the beta sheet, you wouldn't, if you didn't have the model, probably see, or wouldn't know where to place it. And if you use these uh, phases and combine them, you get something uh, much better here uh, at the helix, but also the uh, beta sheet uh, body. And uh, so it's supposed to improve your faces. It doesn't have to. Of course, it could uh, diverge if your start is not good enough and take you to random faces. Or uh, if you take a final structure from the PDB, and subject it to density modification, you will constrain it to uh, apply in our, our previous information, but it will, uh, the phases will change. So in principle, they are deteriorating even if it won't uh, happen a lot. Uh, so the Shell XC approach is the sphere of influence and it's an attempt of uh, introducing more uh, stereochemistry uh, into the process. So it's a high resolution uh, approach uh, similar to the one in ACORN because it uses a different function from the ACORN one but that has the same effect to sharpen the density in the protein region and uh, sets negative density to zero and flips uh, density at the solvent region. And this is decided looking on the surf, sitting on each voxel in turn and looking whether uh, it's surrounded by uh, features typical of the 1-3 uh, atom distances in a polypeptide. So, in this uh, context, autotracing was introduced in Shell XE in 2010 uh, with the aim, as that paper states, of improving facets that were uh, as bad as 60 degrees 
from uh, the solution. And uh, so to pull a solution of such facets, uh, of course, this has changed in time. And in the meantime, it's more uh, things as bad as 70 degrees or 75 that are uh, being pulled. And uh, you can extend a partial solution depending on the data you have and depending on the starting phases. So um, I wish we uh, knew uh, so well as the uh, phaser people know in for molecular replacement how they can predict whether they are going to be able to solve something depending on their model and depending on their uh, data. Um, so these are more examples and heuristics. Uh, I think we can still get better. They are, the limitation is still that we should be able to pull solutions uh, that we are not being uh, um, pushing uh, into a complete solution at the moment. So, for instance, for Alberto Pogliarni, some of those reductase with uh, some 3,000 uh, atoms, but an extraordinary resolution, you can get away with starting from just one atom. And here you have your starting phases are barely better than random with 85 degrees. And if you run 100 cycles, they will very slightly improve after 500 cycles, they are still not so much better, but if you interpret the partial map you have and do auto tracing, then this uh, really uh, um, plummets the, the uh, mean phase uh, difference to the, to the perfect structure, even if the first traces have uh, uh, add very little to it. Uh, so, um, so, uh, interpreting the map is a, a great constraint for density modification to pull a solution. And uh, what can we still do? Well, last study weekend, Rafael Borges was telling about uh, a brute force approach that we were using in Archimboldo, putting all possible sequences on our partial fragments that were uh, compatible with the sequence we had and with some limitations on the secondary structure prediction and so. And uh, uh, one, some uh, consequences of that was you need a lot of computing power to try out all possible sequences on all your fragments, but you can do a low cost solution if you are just extending into the gamma, which already helps a bit, or you can go for hydrophobics, you can go for a partial uh, thing. And uh, I don't know exactly where to uh, mention other well, the, the ARP warp approach, of course, which, which is, uh, has been doing extensive use uh, and very successfully of model building for years and, and uh, in Resolve as well. Uh, so, so uh, probing the gamma position is easy and uh, because it should be in one of three places and one can rely on is there a discrimination between the best density and the worst that you get and only introduce it in that case and leave it out if not. This is from uh, Ray, uh, Jane Richardson's lab uh, work uh, uh, and most of the uh, structure um, criteria I've been looking into are from there. I was really looking into uh, even if I gain very little and first cycle, I don't want to damage things by introducing the uh, gamma position. So in all cases, it's getting staying as it is or getting a bit better when you start putting uh, gamma uh, atoms in, in the density that is uh, extending. Okay, from this to side chain tracing, there was, uh, uh, that was of course the next step. So. Um, Shellex uh, E will uh, now read a um, uh, FASTA file with the sequence. It should uh, limit the lines to 80 characters, but I can change that. And if it doesn't find it or there's any problem with that, uh, it will um, just um, uh, warn you that it's not going to be able to fit side chains and exit great and, and continue. Uh, so as not to disrupt any of the pipelines that like, like Mr. Bump or Ample that are also using Shell XE, uh, while, well, if they want to make use of that. And uh, so um, I thought of the way of uh, doing 
the site uh, building and um, scoring and docking and everything um, so that it wouldn't be a large overhead time and for some 600 residues it will take uh, uh, all in all uh, four extra seconds. So that should be good. And ever since I read this paper by Early, I was, uh, in, which is a wonderful uh, introduction to, to uh, uh, maximum likelihood. Uh, I was dying to use it in some pet project. So of course, uh, that's uh, when you go to docking your sequence to the partial traces you have that will have errors and that are incomplete and everything, you can uh, work in this frame because you know something about what structure should be like and, uh, and you uh, can prove the uh, density that you have uh, against an hypothesis of a, of a, a particular side chain. So, uh, again, I'm very much relying on uh, Jane Richardson's work, and I should really accelerate because I'm lacking 10 minutes. But so, um, um, I looked into uh, using a secondary structure prediction because I have the trace or uh, programming one, but in the end I found best thing was going for the features that are in really old papers because uh, whatever is prominent enough to have been noticed in the first uh, 29 structures that people were looking at, it's uh, going to be a really distinctive feature. And after all, you don't need to get everything right. You just need to get com convinced enough that, that uh, uh, you are looking at the right thing. So. I'm looking at terminators of uh, uh, secondary structure elements and throwing um, the environment of the uh, of, of where a side chain is into uh, the uh, scoring. And of course, uh, one thing that's very reliable is uh, atoms from substructures. If you have selenium or uh, sulfur, in, you know where methion is, or you know where cysteines are, and uh, you. Um, can look at the same time for glycines. If you have no density for beta, there's no point in looking for the side chain. And you can probe whatever is more frequent, aromatics and hydrophobics, because we know from Raphael's work that uh, with your partial non-solved maps, there's not much point in looking at the other things. And then there's the question of what does one constrain, what that was done in force, or what does one reserve and use later to reject things. So for instance, when a Sidechain is trying to pose as another one, what you get is really funny conformers. So you can just uh, prove that and, and recognize afterwards. Okay, so I'm sliding the, all the hypotheses over the sequence and uh, looking into the match of every position and its environment. And yeah, and I can combine that. Okay, so far so good, but where, does, where do the weights come? How do I decide if I trust something that I've scored as a phenylalanine or uh, uh, whether this uh, uh, makes it more li likely that it's going to be something similar, but not exactly that and, and all these things. So I started just inventing the weights myself out of the experience into building maps because one thinks, uh, one knows a lot about uh, uh, having built maps. So what is it one would look at in a map, yeah? But of course, that's not a very respectable way. So again, one thing I was wanting to play with were uh, simple neural networks. And this is a picture of a sculpture called Aurelia Muñoz, who, um, well, her, um, she, she died uh, some years ago. She has been working mainly in the 20th century, but her works were at the MoMA in exhibition this uh, last spring, and it's textile uh, sculptures and reproducing some of Gaudi's constructions, like Gaudi constructed the Sagrada Familia upside down to be able to derive from the weights of, each of the elements how much uh, um, every, every one, each one of his columns and walls was going to need to support. And uh, uh, so this is a bit of the same uh, uh, idea. So I, uh, nothing sophisticated, no PyTorch and no uh, uh, um, TensorFlow and the like, but just 
program my own perceptron and look into the weights that uh, came out, which were very much what uh, I had thrown in first, but a few of uh, surprises were there. So like glycine turned out to, glycine turned out to be much more uh, revealing than, than I had expected to and I modified things to be there. Okay. Uh, so, mm, few of the cases. That was the first uh, 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 case where we uh, solved the new structure and, and uh, traced the side chains, the protein from MK Paul and Steffi uh, Freitag in Durham uh, at 1.9, and that's the scoring. And we use whether uh, uh, we think from the probing that we are going to be able to identify anything, and we uh, um, only will um, extend side chains if there is a discrimination between different ones. Because one of the things that throws you off is if you go wrong with your main chain trace, and then that's what happens here. So black is uh, wrong assignment because there's a wrong connection. So there's no way this and this can all be right. And as a consequence, this thing has nowhere to go anymore. And well, so there's a lot about correcting errors, but mainly on the main chain, which is an interesting thing to do anyway, because we need to change that to uh, interpret uh, micro ID maps where all the algorithm is wrong for the properties of those maps and what are the more prominent features and everything. And, but that's for another day. Um, okay, and some results of a uh, bunch of test structures to, to answer on, on what I'm, uh, and the important thing is to skip and leave unsigned, whatever can be. So acknowledgements. Um, I now like to acknowledge uh, CCP4 for uh, funding, uh, for, for sponsoring my, my uh, uh, Clare Hall College uh, Fellowship last summer because it was a um, wonderful environment to be able to um, play with other things and, and, and concentrate on, on other projects. And of course, George Shelley, who, and I changed the picture that I have by the one in the mixer yesterday where it was part of the quiz to name the scientist on this uh, picture. So the, that's George Shedrick, if anyone got the quiz question uh, wrong, uh, who <laughs> is the, uh, 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 yeah, so. Um, so are there any questions for Isabel? Maybe I can start with one actually as a um, benefit of being the chair. So um, you started off with a, an example where you had just one helix fitted and you were able to improve from there. Um, but I you know, know from bitter experience that if you've got low resolution and weak phases, then it's actually hard to get the right orientation in the first place um, of the helix. So um, do you have any sort of comments about how that kind of error might be um, resolved? Well, Facer is great at placing uh, uh, fragments. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, I think we are more limited in extending solutions. Right? The resolution is limiting us more in the, when you talk about Archimboldo, in the part of the extension than in the part of the fragment placement. That's why I know that there are still things that we can improve in the extension part. Uh, and uh, why, especially if you don't have other helices, you would want to go into the side chains of uh, the helix you have, or you would want to go into the side chains of a beta sheet uh, rather than through the connections of the loops where they, so uh, sure, that's, that's also not limitless, but the bottleneck at the moment is more on, on extending the fragments that uh, uh, Fraser is successfully able to place. Right. Than <laughs> interested you're going back to old papers because part of O that I bitterly regret losing was the ability to fit the five five residue you know, the, you know how he would say I can't remember how he worded it but you know if you have a five residue fragment you may be able to fit that five residue fragment with reasonable accuracy and especially with the beta terms it was you know, it was a brilliant thing it, usually got it right, whereas when I try to build by hand, it automatically often gets wrong. So have you found that this particular 
um, motifs that fit particularly well that help you with your side chain fitting? Um, I, I, by the way, I've also used that old feature in uh, <laughs> my very beginnings. Um, um, well, like the advantage is um, I can go for whatever is more prominent, and uh, um, it's seldom that if the loop was uh, clear enough, uh, if I had density clear enough, it would be extended because it's something connected. But it's more of a challenge to, to jump, for instance, from an edX from from a sheet to the uh, neighbor sheet on a sandwich. And that's where going into the side chains m might, uh, might uh, uh, bring the, the next improvement enough to the next beta sheet to be able to find it. So beautiful work. So in assigning sequence, what about the use of um, evolutionary conservation information or something like that. So this information that is very powerful, giving you relationships between things that are more distant in sequence as well as close in sequence. Mm. Have you thought about trying to incorporate those? Yeah, but it's a bit like in the secondary structure prediction part. So you could do much better, but then you would start getting dependencies with things um, because it's a bit of an overkill to uh, uh, email. either you go to a server or uh, reading files that have been processed somewhere else, but going and programming all this in, inside Shell C is a bit of uh, an overkill and uh, uh, mission impossible, no? So, um? no, no, it's Fortran. <laughs> and uh, so, um, um, it might help, but ultimately you have the density there, so you can try out things. And uh, it, it was ultimately better to go for the more robust things and try all the rest. Cool. Uh, this may be um, a technical question, inappropriate. Um, uh, how do you decide whether a glycine has a C beta or not, if you know what I mean. How do you decide that this is a glycine because it doesn't have C beta density? Well, it's like for the whole of the fitting, you are uh, looking into, the, you are fitting things against the map. So you are looking into the map to see what you have. Mm. And so, okay. so you have no density at the C beta, there might, there might be uh, no, C beta or it might be wrongly traced altogether or so several things can happen but one of them is that you have a glycine and the other thing is uh, if you have weird uh, backbone it's also uh, um, indicative, of, indicative of so and this is something that you have because I uh, keep all the uh, secondary structure of the trace encoded in characteristic vectors. So that's, I can look into that for determination of secondary structure and for the, so I'm looking at density and environment and geometry. Thank you. So um, again, in the interest of time, we have to move on. Um, so we'll thank Isabel again. Uh,